So for this uh, period of time we've been doing a few talks organized around the theme of the five of the sorry the thirty seven wings of awakening, Bodhipakya Dhammas. And uh, for this evening we got around to the theme of the five spiritual faculties, Panchindriyani. So why are there five? Why aren't there four spiritual faculties? Or six? Or maybe there's like seven and a half or something like that. Or five aggregates. Five aggregates? But why are there five aggregates? <coughs> That's how it is, is it? Mm. Five. Five, but couldn't it be six? Like why we divide things up, like it's not obvious. To me anyway, it's not obvious that, you know, this stuff is like fivefold. We could have cut it up in different ways. The Buddha did cut it up in different ways at different times, yeah? So to speak. And uh, why five? Like with the five aggregates, most commonly, it's interesting if you look in the Pali, rarely does it say five aggregates. And very commonly it says Panchupadana Kandaha, the five grasping aggregates. Yeah? And so that maybe gives us a hint because this word Upadana, yeah? Upadana, grasping, taking hold of something. Yeah? So how do you take hold of something? Five fingers. Exactly. Yeah? The five aggregates of grasping, because it's based on the five fingers. And so that's, this is very interesting because these, these numbers have like a pattern. And if we look at the way that numbers are used, uh, especially in ancient times, they always have a symbolic meaning. And we tend to have lost that symbolic meaning. Like the, <clears throat> the, 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 the root of the numbers for us has disappeared. They've become so abstracted we, that, that we lose sight of the actual basis that they come. But five, the origin of the number five, of course, is based on the hand. Yeah? And this way you know, can even use a hand just to, you know, for counting. You know? So like if you count one, two, three, four, five, okay, you know that's five. And so you, it's, like an, it's a system of counting. Just like when you're tallying things, you have the system of tallying one, two, three, four, and then a stroke across, and you have five. Yeah? So this is like the hand, one, two, three, four, and then the thumb goes across. Yeah? So what's the thumb? If you have the five aggregates of grasping, what's the thumb that grasps like that, that comes across? Which one of the five aggregates? Consciousness. That's right, consciousness. And the Buddha said, when consciousness stands, it stands against, or leaning up against, form, feeling, perception, sankharas, okay? volitional formations. Consciousness grasp these things because these are the things that consciousness knows consciousness is the knowing the awareness yeah it knows these things it grasps against them yeah knows the physical body it knows the feelings it knows the perceptions it knows the thoughts and intentions and volitions it knows these things it grasps and that's how we grasp at objects yeah yeah so the suggestion was when we grasp the things, we grasp using the senses. That's how we take hold of things. Yes, that's true. But that's the mechanism. The mechanism that we grasp it with the senses is these five aggregates. When we see something, there's form, feeling, perception, sankharas, and consciousness all there. And that's how we take hold of things. Yeah? So that attachment. This is that metaphor. It's, a very, it's not at all accidental. That's why there's five aggregates. <clears throat> so maybe that's giving us a clue as why there's five spiritual faculties, yeah? 
And maybe it's just a coincidence. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe it's just accident. Maybe it's uh, some trivial and meaningless reason why it's the five spiritual faculties, but I don't believe that. I think there's something very, very significant there. I think maybe this is telling us something about the nature of these spiritual faculties. Yeah? When you have those groups of five, and it's always something, there's the, it's, not, it's never divided up like three and two, yeah? because that's unnatural. How do you do that? Yeah? It's always divided up as one and four. Yeah? So which have the five spiritual faculties? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about these five spiritual faculties. As I'm talking about them, I want you to think, think for yourself and reflect which one is the thumb. Okay? Which one of these five spiritual faculties is the thumb? And then we'll see if we can work it out. And a bit later on, I'll ask and see if anyone's figured it out. Okay. Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. Okay? These are the five spiritual faculties. Faith. Energy, faith, sadha, energy, virya, mindfulness, sati, concentration, samadhi, and wisdom, panya. So, bhaveta bha, the Buddha said, to be developed, yeah, these five things. And uh, part of the path path of practice to develop these five things. Now, just stepping back a little bit and having a look at these things, you know, we remind ourselves, like, what isn't there, yeah? Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. What, what isn't there? Can anyone think of things that aren't there? Suffering's not there. That's interesting. Why isn't suffering there? Aren't those, are those things suffering? And it's interesting because suffering is part of the first noble truth, yeah? This is who we're talking about, the fourth noble truth. But that's, an, that's a subtle point. I might get back to that a little bit later on, but that's quite interesting. Suffering's not there. But what about practices? You know, we don't see like, you know, we don't see that... Uh, um, you're going to have to sign away your whole fortune okay, to Buddhism in order to get into heaven or something like that. That's not there. Yeah? We don't see um, that you have to take any drugs. Yeah? That's not there. We don't see that you're going to have to do uh, any kind of really extreme kind of you know, self-mortification or anything like that. We don't see that you're going to have to um, uh, uh, you know, be, a, be a, a professor of Buddhism, you know, and kind of learn everything that there is to know. About. None of these things are there, yeah? Five spiritual faculties, five qualities of the mind that we can all recognize, yeah? We all know. Faith, okay, we know what that is. Energy, mindfulness, samadhi, wisdom. We can recognize these things to one degree or another inside ourselves. And so this is, always remember, this is what the path of Buddhism is about. This is what the practice is about. These very, very simple mental qualities, spiritual qualities that we can observe within ourselves and we can recognize, yes, this is good. This is um, valuable. This is something that I should develop. Another thing that we see in that group is... You know, it starts with faith and ends with wisdom. Yeah? And, of course, these days often that we're told in sort of kind of modernist forms of Buddhism, we're told that you don't need to have any faith. Yeah? That's quite common. And some people, especially Western people, come to Buddhism because they're traumatized by faith. They've just been told, believe, believe, believe. And they just can't do it anymore. Yeah? You just can't make yourself believe anymore. Yeah? And uh, you know, we know that some of the absurdities that people are coming up with, and I saw uh, the other day 
a, a very good uh, satire of this, and this was, this was this satire that was written in America pretending to be a newspaper article. Of course, it was just a joke, but it was saying that in the state of Arkansas that they'd now banned evolution. Okay? They hadn't just banned the teaching of evolution in schools, they'd actually banned evolution itself. Right? And so they're starting to go around and watching, making sure that insects weren't mutating. And if, if, if they saw a fruit, fruit fly with a mutation, the, it would cause it to adapt better, then of course they'd have to take it and lock it up and fine it and so on, because it was destroying God's plan for, the, for nature and so on. Yeah? And uh, a very funny idea, you know. But this is how, this is how mad we're getting, isn't it? Yeah? This is how, uh, you know, we've been told to believe, 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 and we just can't do it. And so there's this, there's this, um, this dissociation in our minds, in consciousness, because of this, because we're being told, believe, 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 and yet we're, we're also trained to use our reason, we're trained to be rational, yeah? And when we go to school and when we do things, we have to be rational. Even doing things like filling out forms, it's actually quite complicated, isn't it? You know, it's quite stressful. You get this form and you think, oh, I've got to put this stuff and I've got to go all the information, what does this mean? And, and that. And you actually have to be very rational, you know, to do stuff like, you know, use a computer or deal with a bureaucracy. All of these things that we're doing in our daily lives, you have to be very rational and logical. And yet, often, it seems, when we come to religion, we're being told just believe. We're being told to suspend uh, this, this uh, reason. And so this causes like a divorce or a dissociation in consciousness. Now, the roots of that are very deep and are peculiarly Western. Okay? There's something which have arisen for historical reasons in Western cultures uh, because of uh, you know, various, uh, uh, basically the history of how religion, science, philosophy and so on has grown up in the West. I don't, I don't want to go into that here, but we can just acknowledge that there has been this and there has been this war at times between faith and reason. That's not to say that's the whole story. There's many... Um, uh, you know, examples, for example, within Christianity where they've used reason and so on to try to justify and explain their beliefs. But it is interesting how far these things go back. I was reading some time ago a very interesting book that was talking about the Roman philosophers in the second and third century, or third and fourth centuries maybe, and their critiques, the pagan philosophers and their critiques of Christianity and in those days. And... Uh, you know, they were saying that, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, why should we believe this Jewish revelation? Why should we believe this God? People come up with this sacred scripture from somewhere and they put it in front of us and we're just told to believe, yeah? Whereas our religion, which they meant like, uh, say, Neoplatonism or something, is a religion of reason, not a religion of faith. And we've been shown by our teachers, by Socrates, by Plato, by Aristotle, how that we can understand God and the universe and so on through reason. Okay? So why should we believe this thing which is based purely on revelation? And this is the kind of critique which they were developing. Even though that was second, third, fourth centuries. And uh, of course it sounds very modern, doesn't it? And uh, so this is a Western conflict and has not been, uh, you know, historically, this conflict has not taken place in India, it has not taken place in China, it's not taken place in Japan, it's not taken place in Tibet and all the, the Asian countries, only in the West. So it's a bit unfortunate now that, that the West is one of the exports that the West is bringing to the, <laughs> to the rest of the world, is exporting this kind of dissociative consciousness and bringing these kinds of ideas to people where they don't really belong or it's not really necessary. So in Buddhism, it's one of the very, very important things to, to know is that we shouldn't think that there's a, a war between faith and reason, okay? That we shouldn't think that there's some kind of problem there. And this is, it is unfortunate because, uh, as I said, a lot of people in modern Buddhism, especially people from a Western or Christian background, having rejected their own faith that they were brought up in, uh, so, so quite painfully, yeah? Not merely, you know, through kind of just deciding to leave, but having a very painful spiritual, um, going through a painful spiritual process to be able to let go of their religious heritage. Uh, 
and part of that being a, a rejection of the idea of faith and putting one's faith in reason. But of course, it's putting your faith in reason, isn't it? Yeah? You still actually have faith. And a scientist still works by faith all the time, you know? How can a scientist not work by faith? You know, you do an experiment. You're, the very fact that you're doing that experiment is based on your faith in the whole scientific apparatus. You know, you have faith in Newton and his theories. You have faith in Einstein and his theories. You have faith in all the experiments that have been done in the past. You have faith that you can read something in a scientific journal and trust what's said there. Yeah? You have faith that when the chemicals are delivered into your laboratory, that it comes from a company which is trustworthy and it's got, it actually is the chemical that's on the label. Yeah? And it's not going to blow up in your face. Yeah? It's constantly being based on faith. Yeah? And, but it's a faith which is tested. Yeah? Because if you do mix up the chemicals and they do blow up in your face, then you think, okay, something's wrong here, and you test that. And so that's very interesting that in Buddhism, uh, when it talks about doubt, like doubt is very big, very big um, problem for us. When we have doubt, it stops us from moving. And faith is that leap that, mo that, that, will, that, will, that will actually go forward. Doubt, we're stuck. When we're in doubt, we're stuck. And so. It's very interesting that in the in the early suttas, when it says, "What's the, the Sorry, what's the opposite to, to doubt? What do you do if you have doubt?" It doesn't say the opposite to doubt is faith. It says the opposite to doubt is inquiry. Yeah, how to cure doubt is through inquiry. Yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? So we ask questions. Yeah, we doubt, and sometimes people would go to the Buddha. And they say, well, we have doubt about this matter. And he, said, well, he would say, well, yeah, that's perfectly understandable. You're doubting about a doubtful matter. Yeah? He wouldn't just dismiss their doubts and say, have faith. He'd say, no, that's something it's dubious. It's, it's not certain. You, know? you have to investigate. And then he would offer means by which they would investigate. And then through that process, they were able to overcome their doubt. Yeah? And so this is... This is the, uh, uh, the relationship between faith and reason in, in Buddhism. Then, if we can investigate, we can overcome our doubts, then our faith will increase. Okay? And, but then that process keeps on going, keeps on being tested. It keeps on going again and again and again and again. And uh, my favorite example of the, the problem of doubt, and uh, I've, I've told this story before, but I'll, I'll tell it again, is the story that I heard from uh, Chogyam Trumpa, was a well-known Tibetan teacher in America in the 1970s, and one of these very kind of wild, crazy wisdom teachers who used to polish off a bottle of scotch while giving a Dhamma talk. <laughs> Died of psoriasis of the liver. But anyway, he was driving his sports car along the road, and he was coming up to a fork in the road, the left-hand fork, was going to the Dhamma Center and there was a retreat on. Yeah? The right hand fork was going to a really wild party. Which one is he going to take? Yeah? He's going down there, left or right, which one's he going to take? He's getting closer, closer. What am I going to take? Where's he going to take? Doubt. Yeah? He drove straight down the middle and smashed into a tree. Yeah? That's doubt. Would have been much better to go to the party. Yeah? Maybe he could have gone to the party and beaten Bodhisattva and enlightened somebody there. I don't know. Yeah? But what good is it to drive into a tree? Yeah? It's accomplished no good at all. Yeah? So that's the doubt. So this is why, you know, we have to, in that case, you know, think through that case. What is an example? How do you actually solve that? Well, how you solve that problem, first of all, stop your car. Yeah? Park, <laughs> sit by the side of the road, and you think, hmm, what should I really do here? If I go down that left-hand side, all right, I'm going to get to the meditation center, what's going to happen? I'll see people there, I'll be inspired to sit, I'll do some meditation, mm, I'll see the nature of the mind, see reality, see truth, clarify my mind from defilements. If I go to the party, I get drunk, you know, try to chat up some sheilas, you know, maybe uh, do some dancing or something like that. Which one's going to be best for me? Which one should I really do? Hmm. Yeah. And so you can, you, 
reflect on it. Yeah? And then it's through that that you really understand what's going on in your mind. And then you make the decision, one way or the other, and you go. But, you know, you can't... That, that way that insists on faith, on that blind faith, is, is like it's just saying, you know, just go that way. Yeah? And you don't even think about it. You don't know. You don't understand. Yeah? And so then you'll, you'll never understand what the nature of that choice is. You never know. You never understand what you're doing. So that's why it's so important is this attitude of, of reflection and inquiry. Yeah? So never think that these things are, are uh, 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 enemies or opposed to each other. They're not. They're best of friends. So this faith is like what starts us off. It's what kicks us off in the Buddhist path. We, we experience suffering. Because of that suffering, we hear the Buddha teaching about suffering and we know this is the, the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? The Buddha teaching about suffering. Ah, oh, that's, that's, that's what's happening in me. I, I can feel that suffering. I can feel that pain. This is what the Buddha is talking about. This is real. Yeah? This is real. And when we know this is real, then we have faith. This is the way that this is the way that you're going to be leading. You know, I was it was interesting just before coming here. I was talking with some people about this, and they, they asked me what my, um, you know, what 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 did I had challenges to my faith, and I, I kind of stopped. I couldn't really think of anything. I mean, yeah, I had some sort of intellectual problems. I didn't believe in rebirth, and uh, it took me a little while to. To, to overcome that. I still remember very clearly the moment when I, 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 I accepted rebirth. It was on Christmas Day in 1992 at about 11 o'clock in the morning sitting outside the church in a leper colony south of Chiang Mai. And that's the moment when I was just sitting there and suddenly I believed in rebirth. Right. So don't ask me to explain it, okay? <laughs> that just happened. And uh, so there's some things like that. But in terms of like doubting, you know, what the Buddha was teaching and what the path is, I've, I've just never had it. And, you know, I look even before I became a monk and just my few encounters with people who were Buddhists or practicing or meditators. And somehow in me there was always this innate, even though I was an atheist at the time, there was this innate respect and appreciation for what they're doing and uh, a kind of an interest although it wasn't really the time for me and so I, I don't know I've just never really had that problem I've never struggled with doubt so much and uh, perhaps it was very good that on my first retreat I did in Chiang Mai that they didn't really teach me anything they just they just tell you how to meditate okay sit like this do this watch your breath going in and out and so on and so forth. But they didn't actually give teachings as such, so it wasn't really anything to doubt about. Yeah? It was just, just, do this, watch that. You know, what's that feeling? Okay, that's what it is. And, uh, and the experience was so real. What's there to doubt about? There is that experience. That's the reality. So ever since that time, I've had a tremendous faith in the Dharma, what the Buddha was teaching and it's one thing that's important to reflect on is that sometimes we think, uh, yes, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, I can have faith in the Buddha. Yeah, no problems. Buddha, enlightened, fantastic. Dhamma, brilliant. Dependent origination, four noble truths, eightfold path, everything. Fantastic. All fits together, all works, everything. Sangha, amazing. Yeah? There are people who practice those things, realize them, see the truth for himself, abandon defilements, no problems. Have faith in those things, but not me. Right? <laughs> I can have faith in all of those things, yeah? But, of course, that's them. Yeah? Great. Uh, yeah, good on you guys, but uh, not for me. I can't do it. Yeah? I don't have enough baramis. I don't have enough merit. Yeah? I'm not good enough. I've got too many defilements. I, 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 I. <laughs> yeah, that's how we think sometimes. But, of course, that's a very twisted way of thinking because if we think about it, 
you know, what did the Buddha say? Did the Buddha say that? We just said, I have faith in the Buddha, but what did the Buddha say? Did he say, you can't do it? No. The Buddha said, you can do it. Yeah? We said we have faith in the Dhamma, but does the Dhamma say that we can't do it? The Dhamma says, you know, these fact is Four Noble Truths, we can understand Four Noble Truths. Eightfold Path, yeah, we can understand those things. Is there anything in the Dhamma that says you can't do it? No, there's nothing in the Dhamma that says you can't do it. The Sangha? Is the Sangha saying that you can't do it? Have we ever found any enlightened monks who've said, oh no, you don't worry about practicing, don't worry about that, just come and give me lots of stuff and then make merit and then in the future life, then you'll be right. You know, There are monks who teach like this, but I suspect they're perhaps not enlightened ones. Yeah? It's just my suspicion, okay? It's personal bias. I can't prove this. In my opinion, all the monks that look like they may be somewhere along the path, they all say, yeah, great, go for it. You can do it. Yeah? You can do it. So if you really have faith in those things, if you really have faith in the triple gem, then we have faith in ourselves as well. Yeah? We are just the same. The Dhamma is just the same. We're living in here. We're living in the Dhamma. We're swimming in it. Yeah? Just like we're all swimming in the law of gravity. The law of gravity is a physical law. Not one person is obeying the law of gravity more than anybody else. Okay? We're all obeying the law of gravity to exactly the same degree. Huh? And you can't disobey it if you wanted to. The law of Dhamma is a spiritual law. And we all obey the law of Dhamma to exactly the same degree. We are all swimming in the Dhamma, each as we're sitting here. We can't get out of it. We can't leave it. You can't forget the Dhamma. You can't not be in the Dhamma. This is our life. Our life is constituted of these things. The six senses, the five aggregates, the feelings, the perceptions, the thoughts, everything, these things that are going on in you right here and now, this is the Dhamma. You can't get away from it. And so this is our field. This is where we're practicing. So these five spiritual practices start with this faith, understanding this is what the Triple Gem is about. This is what my practice is about. This is where I have to start off from. And when we have this faith, of course, the faith gives rise to energy. Yeah? We want to practice. We want to make that leap. We want to go forward. We want to say, yes, I'm going to dedicate myself. Yes, I'm going to study the teachings. Yes, I'm going to sit meditation. Yes, I'm going to make an effort to overcome my sense of annoyance and anger with people in my life. Yes, I'm going to try to let go. I'm going to be more content. Yes, I'm going to um, make a determination. I'm, I'm going to respect the environment. I'm not going to you know, live a high energy lifestyle anymore. I'm going to make those changes to my lifestyle, give up those things that's necessary so that I can look after the environment better. I'm going to, yes, I'm going to make that bit of extra effort to, do, to devote a certain number of hours each week to voluntary charity work. Yeah? That takes effort. Yeah? Yes, I'm going to, to make that effort to read at least one sutta every week. Yeah? I'm going to make that effort to sit meditation every morning. We have, when we have the faith, we reflect on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha like that. We remember this is how they did it. This is how the Buddha practiced. Yeah? Remember the Buddha didn't practice by sitting around drinking coffee and talking about Dhamma. Yeah? talking about Buddhism. <laughs> this is not how the Buddha himself practiced. He practiced by getting out there, going into the forest, sitting under the, root of the, in, under the tree, at the root of the tree. Meditate, 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 meditate. That's what the Buddha did. So this is why we have a Buddha image. The, the image of the Buddha is there to remind us. We have the, this image of this perfect human. This image, which is like, we've seen it so many times. Yeah? It's an archetype. It's a spiritual archetype. It's seared itself into our consciousness. This idea of a Buddha sitting there perfect, balanced. 
that image of the unparalleled image of human perfection. That sitting, putting forth effort is what he's doing. So this is these things interconnected, having that faith will lead to the energy. Yeah? The energy will lead to mindfulness. Yeah? When we when we when our, we want to practice, we want to devote ourselves to Dharma, then we will be we will bring that sense of mindfulness. Okay, mindfulness a sense of full, uh, sustained, collected continuity of awareness. Okay. A sustained continuity of awareness. This is what mindfulness is about. Sustained and reflective continuity of awareness. Watching what we're doing when we're doing it. Knowing what we're doing when we're doing it. When we're walking, we know we're walking. When we're sitting, we know we're sitting. When we're eating, we know we're eating. Yeah? Going to the toilet, we know we're going to the toilet. Talking to people, we know we're talking to people doing our spiritual practices. We know we're doing the spiritual practices. Doing the shopping. We know we're doing the shopping. This is a practice of mindfulness. And then when we come to sit meditation, all that mindfulness that we've developed through the day, all that mindfulness, that comes to help us. That comes and that focuses just on that one thing. That one thing. That one breath that's happening right now. The whole of our awareness and consciousness is with, absorbed into that breath that's happening right now. That fullness of mindfulness. So that the mind is, is absorbed completely in that and yet with nothing outside. So there's like a fullness. There's not a scatteredness. There's a fullness of it being, being held there. And yet a, a breadth to it as well. It's broad. So please don't think that when we're talking about meditation, we talk about focusing the mind and these kinds of things, that it means, you know, trying to, to, to force our mind to go, go, go into somewhere where it's still or unified. That's not, what, that's not the point of it. The actual feeling, the experience of it is very broad. Yeah? And uh, the best way I can describe that, because as, as a young boy I was a great science fiction fan, so I always used to watch Doctor Who. And Doctor Who's TARDIS, as everyone should know, is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Yeah? And you look at it from the outside and it just looks like a phone box. And then you go inside and it's this huge, massive thing that just goes for miles, never stops. You don't know how big it is. And that's what the mind is like in meditation. If you look at the breath, that's what it's like. It looks like something small. It looks like just this bit of air coming in and out. It just lasts for a second or a fraction of a second. It's just this very subtle movement. There's not much to it. It's very small. And yet when you go inside it, it becomes huge. Yeah? There's a vastness to it. Which, which, which is also very true, isn't it? Because even just purely on a, on a literal and physical scale, the breath is everywhere, isn't it? This air which we're breathing in is the same as the air which is all around us. Yeah? There's no difference. Yeah? So on the one hand, we look at the air is just in there, but then when we go inside it, the air is everywhere. Yeah? That's a paradox in meditation. And so sometimes you might hear people talking in different ways. Like we hear, you know, we talk about word like concentration. Yeah? Uh, and it sounds like we're going to have to like force ourselves to just look at one thing and can't look at anything else. Well, there's, there's something to that. It's not completely wrong. But it's only one side of it. And if we force ourselves too much, then we'll get a case of samadhi headache. Yeah? And that's very sad. Because normally you do the meditation to get rid of the headache, but if you're giving yourself the headache from your meditation, then there's nothing, you can't do anything about it. So that mindfulness, if we practice it like that, will lead to concentration. And this is one of the things that the Buddha has said about mindfulness and somebody who's practicing mindfulness correctly, someone who's practicing mindfulness the right way, that will lead to samadhi. It will lead to a concentration of mind. So the word samadhi, of these words, I think the word faith, I think we can, sadha in Pali, I think we can translate as faith, 
fairly well. Virya, energy, that's pretty good translation. I'm quite happy with that. Sati, mindfulness, seems to work fairly well. And uh, that was that mindful translation of Sati is mindfulness was originally made by uh, uh, Mr. R- Mr. Rhys Davies, the great Buddhist Indologist, British Indologist, about the end of the 19th century. And uh, Samadhi, on, on the other hand, we can't really translate. It's very difficult. There's no real word for that in English. They usually use concentration, okay? So concentration has three elements, right? Con, right? which means together, yeah? which is okay. That's the same as samadhi, actually. The, the, the root sum in samadhi also means the same as con, like together. So con, sent, yeah? centering, yeah? bringing to the middle. That's also pretty good. Yeah? We're bringing everything together in the middle. And then the last part is the Asian. Okay? Now this is the bit I have problems with. All right? now this isn't a racial turn, okay? I don't have anything against Asians as such. It's not the Asian, it's Asian, okay? Now the Asian means like a doing. So when we use that, that kind of form in English, it's like making. So like concentration is like making it come together in the center. And that's the bit I have a bit of problems with. So maybe... It's not quite such normal English, but a word like concentering, yeah? or maybe just centering of the mind, perhaps. But there's nothing really that captures it in English, so I usually just use the Pali term. Hopefully that will become more and more uh, useful. So samadhi, sam means together, adhi means to uh, compose or bring together. So maybe we use a word like composure or coalescence. Coalescence is a nice word. And that's quite nice because when something coalesces, it's not like it's being forced. It's just like it happens that way. It, it, things come together. Yeah? The coalescence of the mind. And that's really what samadhi is about, is a coalescence of mind. And of course, when the Buddha uh, talked about samadhi uh, in the four... In the five spiritual faculties, then, of course, he always defined it as the four jhanas. And, uh, but in addition, he is using the four jhanas. He also used another phrase, which is quite interesting. Having made relinquishment the object, or having... having Having, having supported oneself on relinquishment or perhaps relying on relinquishment, one gains samadhi, one gains one-pointedness of mind. Okay? So relying on letting go, yeah? one gains samadhi, one gains one-pointedness of mind. And that's a very, very important phrase, yeah? talking about it, because that samadhi comes from letting go. And even that one little phrase, again, captures these paradoxes of meditation. Having made relinquishment the object, so having, you know, relying on letting go, one gains. Labati means to gain. One gains samadhi, one gains one pointedness. So on the one hand, there's like a letting go. On the other hand, there's this getting, there's this gaining. And so you can actually use language in either way. Okay? It has a positive aspect. You can say it's getting something, or you can say it has a negative aspect. It's letting go of something. Yeah? It's like the, the dark and the light sides. So even like I was talking before about faith, you know, like faith and doubt, yeah? They're like a dark and a light side of the same thing. And that's, that's something that's very interesting, actually. I forgot to mention talking about faith and doubt. But that's very, very important. Doubt is another reason why faith and doubt are not opposites, because faith and doubt both are unified in the sense that they care. Okay? We don't doubt about something that we don't care about. Yeah? Doubt is a state of intense interest in something. Yeah? Even if we're doubting, say, the teachings of Buddhism, that means we, we, we're thinking about it. Yeah? We're, we're thinking, oh, can it be, is rebirth true? You know? is, does a person get reborn? I can't believe that. There's no evidence for it. It's not scientific. Yeah? 
the, bo- the, the mind is based on the brain, and when the brain disappears. I, and then the Buddha, all these Buddhist teachings are supposed to be talking about rebirth, and I can't accept that. So you have this state of doubt, which many people have. But you're still interested in that. You want to know. Yeah? It's not that you just don't care. So then somebody else maybe doesn't doubt about it. They're simply not interested. It never crosses their mind. They only care about football and cricket or something like that. You know. So the very fact that you're doubting means that you're interested in something. It means you think it's important. Yeah? And so that's why doubt and faith are actually just very, very close. Yeah? Very, very close to opposite sides of the same coin. And so these things, there's always like a positive and a negative side. And the same with samadhi. You know, we can talk about gaining a state of concentration. We can talk about, uh, you know, gaining a jhana or, or gaining a state of, of um, purity of mind or something like that. Or we can talk about letting go of the five hindrances, letting go of attachments, letting go of any kind of interest in sense experience, any kind of wanting to be here in this body and seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Letting go of all these things is also samadhi. Entering into jhana is also samadhi. And so it has this positive aspect and this negative aspect. And so we shouldn't try to trivialize this practice of samadhi. It's not something... Samadhi is not something really which we should be talking about, you know, practice of samadhi in, in daily life. Okay. You can't get samadhi in daily life. It doesn't happen. And if it did, you'd probably crash your car or something like that. Actually, I, I, I know one monk who, who did that, actually. And um, when, before he was a monk, he, when he was a lay person and he was driving. And uh, he'd just been in this kind of family gathering or kind of reunion or something like that. And he was really kind of um, quite emotionally very uplifted and very joyous. And then kind of driving back this kind of long drive in the middle of the night and his mind was so bright and happy and that, that he, he really thinks that he went into a state of samadhi while he was driving his car and then smashed his car. So this can happen, yeah? It's not, uh, not, not desirable. Samadhi is something that's special, okay? And in a sense, it's delimited. So, so the other things, faith, energy, mindfulness, yes, we do this all the time. Samadhi is more delimited, yeah? It has its own sphere, how do people talk about it? What is it like entering into a state of samadhi? Well, you know, people describe it in different ways. One of my friends said it's like, uh, like being drawn into a world of radiant bliss, frozen radiant bliss and light. Okay? And just so entering into this world, and that's all there is, just bliss and light, frozen there. In, in a state of like suspended time, Con- consciousness in a state of suspended time. There's no movement, there's no thought, there's no uh, sense experience, no sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, mind's not moving at all, just absorbed in that experience of oneness and unity. This is what we call samadhi. And of course this is, you know, those, those mystical experiences which the sages of all religions have talked about. Samadhi's never, Buddhism's never claimed that samadhi is unique to itself. But what is unique about it is the, the, the way that we gain it and the way that we look at it, we reflect on it. We don't say that light is God. Yeah? We don't say, I've now become one with the universe. Yeah? We don't say, I've, I've seen the, the face of the truth. Yeah? Any of those things. What we say is, we had an experience. Yeah? That was an experience of that was like this. Yeah? We can try to describe it as best we can. And this is one of the great contributions that the Buddha made to spiritual discourse was that he talked about these experiences in uh, an, an analytic or and a psychological way. He would look at well, what are the mental factors that are going on there. Rather than using... Uh, very evocative language, like in the Brahmanical scriptures, that, you know, they would use these evocative words, you know, say, Tadpongasi, you know, thou art that. Yeah? You know, it was one of the most memorable, fantastic phrases in spiritual literature, you are that. Wow. You know? But, you know, what, what exactly does it mean? Yeah? Of course, it can mean anything to, to, you know, depending on how you interpret it. So the Buddha 
tried to demystify these things as much as he can and tried to take it out of a system of belief, a framework of belief. He's not trying to persuade you that this is something. He's trying to point you to the fact that, well, what is the experience like? What are you actually experiencing in such a state? And so when you emerge from that kind of state, then you reflect, okay, what was that? Don't try to tell yourself this was this, this was that. You're not interested in saying this is second jhana, this is fourth jhana, this is blah, blah, blah. But just what is the experience like? Yeah? What is my mind like? So this is why when we do the guided meditation, that each time at the end of the guided meditation, then we reflect back. Okay? Even if we've just had a little bit of samadhi, a little bit of meditation, we, can, we, still, we train ourselves, we train the mind in that habit of reflecting back at the end. Don't do it in the meditation. That's very, very bad, okay? So when you're in the meditation, you never think about your meditation, okay? <laughs> you just do it, yeah? And uh, that will destroy it immediately if you start thinking about it while you're actually doing it. It's very, very bad. Get to the end, and then you reflect back. And because the mind has been so clear and so bright and with such good mindfulness, then when you reflect back, you can see very clearly what's going on. And this is when that wisdom will arise, okay? So this is that last of the five spiritual faculties is the wisdom, the understanding, yeah? Now, in defining these things, when the Buddha defined them, he defined each of these factors in terms of a group of four. So the f faith is what we call the four factors, uh, four kinds of right faith or the four factors of stream entry is uh, faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and also keeping of precepts, five precepts. So that's included under faith here, Okay? Energy is the four right efforts, which we discussed, uh, I think, last week. Is the energy to arouse, sorry, the energy to, to get rid of unwholesome dhammas, to prevent unwholesome dhammas from arising, to give rise to wholesome dhammas, and to sustain and develop wholesome dhammas that have arisen. So the four kinds of right effort. Right. Mindfulness is the four satipatthanas. Right, samadhi, samadhi, faculty of samadhi is the four jhanas and wisdom is the four noble truths. Okay? So each of the five spiritual faculties is defined in terms of a group of four. So that makes it easy to remember. I won't go through them again. Okay? Four noble truths. But again, as I mentioned with the with the... Um, spiritual faculty of samadhi. The same with the spiritual faculty of wisdom. That although the Buddha gives the standard definition of wisdom, which is very common throughout the sutras in terms of the Four Noble Truths, but he also gave a very, a very unusual or unique definition, uh, which uh, went something like this. I can't remember the exact phrase now. No. I should have read it before I came. It's something like uh, that, the, that a first point is not known. The beginning of this sangsara, the first point of this faring on in sangsara is not known or not knowable. But for one, one who's reflecting in this way, then that he, so he to use the phrase that dark mass of ignorance. Yeah, one of my favourite phrases in in, uh, in Buddhism. That that entire that whole dark mass of ignorance, yeah, will fade away. So one who's reflecting with a mind of samadhi. The brightness of the mind, yeah? The brightness of the mind. You see that light in the mind when you're practicing. You get it in deep meditation, practice of samadhi, that light in the mind, and that is the light which disperses that dark mass of ignorance. Okay? Shining that light into that space. And then you see, this is what has been keeping me in suffering. This is why I've been trapped. This is why I've been caught up. Yeah? This is what's been this this is how I've been torturing myself, this is how I've been torturing others. And you can see that by shining that light in there. 
And so this understanding of impermanence, understanding of, of uh, the nature of truth, the nature of reality is something that emerges, deepens through this practice. You know, I mentioned that the, the, the realization of faith, improvement of faith comes through inquiry. So we learn, we inquire, we study Buddhism, answer questions about it, solve our doubts. And that gives us a certain degree of wisdom. But that wisdom at that stage is not enough for us to really penetrate and see the Dhamma. Only when it's empowered by samadhi, then it will see. It will penetrate right through that entire dark mass of ignorance. Yeah? And that's the wisdom. So now I just want to come back to the question I asked before. What is the thumb? Yeah? Wisdom. Wisdom's the thumb. Eva. Faith. Faith is the thumb. Yeah? Mindfulness. Mindfulness is the thumb. Ah. Which one is it? Of course, there's no kind of right answer in a sense. Any other suggestions? We've got three out of five so far. <coughs> Anyone thinks that energy is the thumb? You can't do it without energy, can you? Pretty important. What about samadhi? Is that the thumb? You need faith first. You need faith first, yeah. In, in such a controversial situation now, <laughs> I couldn't be held responsible for giving the wrong answer, so I'll just have to defer to my teacher, Buddha. And uh, according to the suttas, the thumb is wisdom. So, our first gentleman was right. He wins the steak knives. And uh, <laughs> he would have used the simile, which is very apt for those of us at Santi Monastery at the moment, of the rafters of, a, of the roof. And so, if you're building a roof, yeah, you have the four rafters which you put up against each other. So, you can leave two here and two there. You lean them up against each other. But they're kind of wobbly. Yeah, they're staying there, but they're wobbly. And as long as wisdom is not there, wisdom is the ridge pole. Yeah, and it locks them in together. And so when wisdom is there, they're locked in together. Yeah, and so that's that wisdom, especially the noble wisdom, the wisdom of enlightenment, will lock those other things. As long as you don't have that, then they will decline. Yeah, you can get all the jhanas you like in the world. If you don't have that good wisdom, then sooner or later your samadhi is going to decline. But when you have that together, the wisdom will lock them into place. Yeah? So wisdom is the thumb. <coughs>